Sane Occultism by Dion Fortune Narrated by Matthew Schmitz 5. Meditation and Psychism Many people think that it is impossible to conduct any research into the unseen unless definite clairvoyant powers have been developed. This, however, is not the case. After we have reached a certain stage of training, we can penetrate far into the unseen by means of meditation. Occult meditation is a combination of the two methods of free association and directed reverie. It begins with free association, starting with an idea which is known to have been derived from the inner planes by the operation of the higher consciousness. That is why such books as The Voice of the Silence are so valuable for meditation, and passes over, or should pass over, into directed reverie. The secret of success lies in keeping the mind steadily on its plane and subject, but leaving it free within the limits of that subject, an operation which requires considerable experience and skill. This method has yielded us an enormous amount of our occult knowledge, for by its use, not only the experiences, but also the teachings received on the inner planes are brought through into brain's consciousness. But, like all other research, it requires counter-checking, and much confusion and discredit have resulted from the failure to observe this very necessary precaution. The findings of meditation must perforce remain nothing but speculations until they have been counter-checked and proved, and what we need in occult science is a method of proof which shall test the results without spoiling the experiment. The psychoanalytical tests cannot satisfactorily be applied to the results of meditation because there are, admittedly, the fruits of the subconscious mind, although the occultist takes a much broader view of the subconscious mind than the psychologist does. The analysis of meditation simply reveals that the conscious mind is obtaining access to the subconscious mind and availing itself of the hoarded material of the hidden self. This, of course, neither proves nor disproves the value and accuracy of the results. If the subconscious contains the truth, the findings of the meditation will be true and it in no way reduces the value of subliminal material to prove that it has been stored in the subconscious memory, for it may very well have got into that memory as a result of a true psychic vision which has not been brought through to consciousness. In dealing with the fruits of meditation or reverie, we need to check the facts, not the origin of them, for the value of the teaching thus obtained does not depend upon its source, but on its intrinsic nature. We need to escape from the dominion of authority if we are to do any serious work in occult research. The value of a message from the inner planes or inner self does not depend on the name claimed by the communicating entity, but on the nature of its message. The spirit of Victor Hugo has had some ghastly doggerel fathered upon it, and many other great intellect has discoursed in vapid platitudes when recalled from the unseen. Because a spirit calls itself Victor Hugo, does not mean that it is Victor Hugo, and even if it were, what is the use of listening to it if it talks nonsense? And if, out of our own subconscious mind, we can elaborate material that is of value, shall we have the spiritual snobbishness to scorn it because of its homely origin? The subconscious mind is infinitely richer than the conscious mind, containing as it does everything we have ever forgotten, everything which has ever impinged on a sense organ, whether consciousness has noticed it or not, and also, according to occult science, the experiences of the astral body during sleep and the memories of past incarnations. It is therefore clear that if we gain access to our subconscious mind, we have obtained possession of a rich storehouse of memory. But as, by definition, the subconscious mind is below the level of consciousness, it follows that the consciousness cannot penetrate to the level of subconsciousness, but must find some evidence to induce the subconscious content to become conscious. This is achieved by means of the directed reverie of occult meditation. It is this brooding of meditation which causes the development of much occult knowledge and which might more truly be called the Hall of Learning than the Astral Temple of the Imagination, which usually goes by that name. It is much more likely that the occult doctrines have been elaborated by these natural means than by anything spectacular in the way of Manus and Messiahs materializing on the physical plane. That which is spiritual works upon the plane of spirit and has to be brought through to the mental plane by mental means and to the physical plane by physical means, each plane being governed by its own laws. There are, it is true, 
souls among us of more than human stature, but the difference is in degree of development, not in kind. We all are potential adepts. Some are adepts in the making, and just a few are adepts in actuality. Nature does not leap gaps. I do not mean by these words to discredit the idea of great teachers in the past, nor the possibility of great teachers in the present or the future, but I do most earnestly desire to discredit the idea of miracle and substitute that of law, natural and knowable, and a piece of with that which is known and proven of man and the universe. Let us then, if we desire to be true students of occult science, attach less weight to our visions and more to our meditations, until we come to the point when the consciousness, which opens momentarily in vision, has become part of our normal equipment, and we are so used to it as to be able to assess its value and use it at will. But on the other hand, let us never forget that there is no such thing as revelation to brain consciousness. The revelation is always to the higher self, and has then to be translated through into brain consciousness. In that translation, discrepancies may occur, and therefore all revelation and inspiration, even the clearest, requires counterchecking. Our problem, then, is to devise a scheme of counterchecking that shall effectually test the truth of the fruits of meditation and inspiration, while leaving room for new discoveries of occult science. Do not let us accept the limiting position that the occult teachings have once and for all been delivered to man, for surely, as evolution advances, there must come a time when brain consciousness is able to receive more than heretofore, and so will be given more. But let us also remember that what it receives will be but an extension of that which it has already received, and will most assuredly fit in with it, and not contradict it. Neither, if the experience of the immemorial past is any guide, will there be any new factors or sudden departures introduced. Nature is never arbitrary, whether on the visible or invisible planes. As above, so below, has ever been the maxim of the occultist, and is a clue which will take us safely through the labyrinth, and to it we must cling. Again, applying the maxim, as above, so below, we shall find that a thing which is true on any plane of the cosmos is true through the whole of its system of correspondences. For instance, the same laws that apply to the solar system also apply to the atom. If, then, we are testing any item of clairvoyant research, let us apply its findings to the solar system and the human system, and if we find that it is true of both of these, then we may reasonably conclude that it is true concerning the thing to which it claims to apply. Take, for example, the researches of the late Dr. Steiner regarding Atlantis and Lemuria. Modern exploration and deep-sea soundings confirm the existence of a lost continent, and the new psychology shows, in its descriptions of the levels of the mind, states of consciousness which exactly correspond with the states of intellectual development which Dr. Steiner assigns to the different root races, thus confirming his statements just as embryology confirms the theory of evolution by showing in the individual the stages of development by which the species is believed to have evolved. We may, therefore, feel ourselves upon reasonably safe ground in accepting Dr. Steiner's account of the root races, and when, in addition to this geographical and psychological confirmation, we also find a substantially similar doctrine set forth by Madame Blavatsky as derived from the ancient wisdom of the East, for which derivation she gives chapter and verse from these sacred books, we feel that we have the double confirmation of an ancient esoteric system and modern research, and we may therefore accept the doctrine of the root races as a fact established according to the laws of evidence with which we have to be content in dealing with the subjective planes. Some of the occult theories that are being advanced nowadays, however, cannot be so tested. They have no correspondence with any occult system. They fit in nowhere among proven truths. Some of their supporters claim that their uniqueness proves the wonderful psychic powers of their promulgators, but the experienced occultist replies that it is their uniqueness which is their undoing, for it proves them to be no part of the cosmic scheme, whichever moves and cycles. That which has been comes around again on a higher arc, and nothing opens up in evolution whose germs are not implicit in involution. It is high time that we should turn around and ask for the evidence in support of the statements that are made in the name of the unseen, and let us dare, in the sacred cause of truth, to say not proven when that evidence is not forthcoming. There is no religion higher than the truth, 
not even personal loyalty to a beloved leader. We must recognize, however, that in occultism, a kind of evidence has to be admitted which would not be admitted in orthodox science, which is one of the causes of the latter's sterility when it applies itself to the study of life and mind. Subjective, as well as objective evidence, has to be accepted, because so much of the work of occultism lies in the subjective sphere, that is to say, in the realm of inner experience. A man may say, for instance, that he has had a certain inner experience, and as that experience is peculiar to him alone, no independent witness can be adduced in support of his statements. His word is the only evidence, and therefore we are told that we ought either to accept or reject his word. The world of orthodox science says, reject the unverifiable statement, the unrepeatable experiment. The world of occult science is very apt to say, accept the statement without trying to verify it, for it is on such statements that our structure of thought is built, and if you throw down one, the whole edifice of our faith will collapse. What answer can we make of this? Is there no via media? I suggest that we have two quite definite and quite independent criteria of criticism. Firstly, in the ancient occult systems that are guarded by these schools of initiation, and secondly, in psychology. Not, of course, in psychology as popularly understood, but in the deeper application of it, which is being developed along esoteric lines. The ancient occult systems always have a pantheon of gods and goddesses who are all definitely related to each other as parents and offspring, brothers and sisters. There they are, in great ramifying families, and wonderful stories are told of their adventures, stories wild as the fairy tales that delighted our youth. And after we have listened to all these fantastic and sometimes obscene absurdities, we are told, as above, so below, and find that if we follow out the symbolism, we have an Adrian thread which will take us through the labyrinth, not only of the universe, but also of our own natures. We shall find, moreover, that these different ancient pantheons have a strong resemblance to each other, and likewise that the cosmologies to be adduced from them are practically identical, and we may fairly reckon that in those things wherein they confirm each other, all the world over they are substantially correct. Against these ancient, definite schemes of things, let us measure the findings of our modern psychics, and if we find that they fit in and are confirmed, then we may reasonably believe that we have received a genuine contribution to our occult knowledge. But if violence has to be done to the ancient systems, if they have to be pulled and pushed to make them fit, we would do well to look for the discrepancies in the findings of the modern psychic rather than in the immemorial faith of the ancients. By these tests, we can countercheck all contributions to esoteric cosmology. They must fit in with the ancient systems and modern demonstrable science. But, on the other hand, we must not demand of psychism proofs which by its very nature it is unable to give. We must bear in mind the fact which modern thought tends to forget, that there are two kinds of logic, deductive as well as inductive. Modern inductive science is a reaction from the deductive methods of the ancients, but the inductive method is not possible in any department of knowledge until we have a mass of particulars from which to build up a general concept. When we are dealing with matters already known in their broad outlines, we can, without unnecessary delay in starting, accumulate a mass of observations and set to work with the inductive method. But when we are dealing with the totally unknown, as we often are in occult research, the deductive method is the only one that we can use at the start, for we have no means of knowing whether to direct our observations nor what facts are relevant. Occult science makes great use of intuition and deduction, but having built up a system of concepts by such means, these concepts, if valid, should be capable of confirmation by the use of the experimental, inductive method of orthodox science. Our previous intuitive, deductive researches serve to indicate to us the direction in which to look for our data and the line along which our researches are likely to proceed. But while such indications are invaluable and save an immense amount of time, we should not be content with purely subjective, intuitional methods, but follow up our psychic researches with experimental confirmation and not reckon any psychic vision or teaching as proven until this has been done. Faith and authority have no more part in occult science than they have in natural science. Those teachings of occult science which are not capable of immediate proof should be classed as hypotheses, and the chela should no more be asked to give blind belief than the student of chemistry. 
It is quite true that the higher branches of both sciences are only accessible to those who have fitted themselves by training for their comprehension. But from the very start, modern chemistry training combines theory with practice, and so it should be with occultism. Does this mean, however, that occultism itself is a delusion? I think we have ample evidence that this is not the case. Out of the flood of credulity and wasted effort, there stand up certain mountain peaks. There is more in heaven and earth than is dreamed of in the orthodox philosophies, and it is this that occultism takes for its field, and the fact that its most ancient teachings have received confirmation from modern scientific research shows that its work has not been wholly fruitless. When, however, I listen to the talk of some of those who are interested in occultism, I feel as if I had returned to the Dark Ages. So much of it is sheer credulity and superstition. Such romantic previous incarnations, such wonderful auras, such authoritative teachings received from the masters, everything accepted without any counter-checking or attempt at verification. Now, I do not dispute that such things are possible. In fact, I may say that from my own personal experience, I am satisfied that there is adequate evidence in support of all these things, and can and do accept them as part of my personal faith, but I cannot help saying that a great many of the anecdotes that I have heard recounted impress me as very far-fetched. In the old days, it was the custom to deny anything that was not as tangible as the Dome of St. Paul's. Nowadays, it seems to be the fashion to accept anything that is mysterious. People quote the statement of a psychic about their past incarnations or the state of their auras as proof positive. If it were not that there is so strong a feeling in occult circles for humanitarianism, I have no doubt that we should find people scrabbling in the interiors of cocks in search of omens. There are statements current in occult circles concerning mysterious occult colleges and their marvelous museums and libraries, and the masters and their mundane habitations, which, in their widespread acceptance and lack of tangible evidence, bear a strong family likeness to the rumors concerning the passage of the Russian troops through England, which were current during the early days of the war. Everybody had heard them, and nearly everybody believed them for to do otherwise was to be accused of pro-Germanism, and although they no doubt served some useful purpose in keeping up our hearts during the dark days of the retreat, it is a curious chapter in crowd psychology that the man who preferred to base his patriotism on fact rather than fancy should have met with persecution and have been dubbed an enemy. A nervous crowd is a dangerous thing, and it is a bold man who will lay sacrilegious hands on the popular idols which quiet its fears. But it will not be until we break free from authority in occultism, whether that authority be claimed for the seen or the unseen, that we shall do any more serious work in this department of thought than the schoolmen of the Dark Ages did in natural science. The need of certainty is very strong in human nature. It is only a highly trained mind that is able to suspend judgment on insufficient evidence. But it is better to endure the torture of uncertainty than to believe a lie, and I am convinced that if popular occultism would be content to do as a great industrial undertaking has recently done, cut its capital in half, it would find it was able to pay dividends on the remainder and become once more a solvent concern. Great is truth, and shall prevail, and no one who is sincere need fear her.